Hello? 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 Welcome back. Geography, physical geography. We are now moving on to the mountains. So, now, what if you have stable air? Nothing really happens, right? The air doesn't release heat. It doesn't contract. It stays pretty much the same. But sometimes there are things that change that, and one of the things is mountain ranges. If air is moved by wind and it hits a mountain, you know, wind can't blow through dirt, right? It has to go over it. <clears throat> if you blow across a mountain, the wind goes uphill. And so what happens is that air that is just sitting there now is being moved, but it's being moved up in elevation. And what do we say? When you go up in elevation, air pressure decreases, so the latent heat, the air, expands. And as the air expands, it cools. And as the air cools, as we'll talk about, it loses its moisture. So as air moves up the sides of mountain ranges or up hills, <clears throat> it loses its humidity in the form of moisture and then eventually rain, and it cools off. When it gets to the other side of the mountain <clears throat> and it goes back down, it goes back down. As it goes down, it gets compressed, so it heats back up. But here's the thing, it's already lost its moisture. So now it's warm, dry air. Here's an example. Here's a mountain on the coast of the ocean and the wind blows from the ocean and it's warm and moist, but it hits this mountain, now it gets blown up and blown up. And here is the LCL at a thousand feet. So now clouds form and we keep on going up and now it turns into rain. <clears throat> And more and more moisture is being pulled out as the air cools. But now the air is below freezing. And so it's not rain, it's snow. And so by the time it gets to the top of the mountain, it has lost most of its moisture and it has cooled dramatically. But now it basically rolls down the other side of the hill. Gravity pulls it back down. So as it comes back down, it starts to compress or heat up. But it's dry. And so what we have is this unique... A geological feature called rain shadows. <clears throat> Hawaii, if you've ever been to the Hawaiian Islands, it's a great example. Hawaiian Islands are in the middle of the ocean. They're 3,000 miles from land. So wind blows across the ocean, and if all that moisture gets picked up, when it hits the islands, the wind generally comes from the north and the east. When it hits these islands, it begins to go up the side of the island. And the Hawaiian Islands are volcanoes. So these are volcanic mountains. And so what happens is you have these big range of mountains right on the coast. All the moisture, as you can see right here, the rainfall is heaviest on that north side of the mountain. And when it comes back down, it's hot and dry. <clears throat> so the big island of Hawaii right here, the volcanoes here are 14,000 feet tall, very tall mountains. This right here, is where the city of Hilo is. It is the wettest city in the United States. 330 inches of rain a year. By comparison, we get about 30. On the other side of the island, 80 miles away, is the town of Kona. It gets about seven inches of rain a year. When you look at it from space, you can actually see right here, this ridge is the top of the mountains. This is all green. You see the clouds coming up and all the moisture. And when it comes down the other side, it's dry. This is rocky and very almost like a desert. Here's another example. This is the Pacific Coast. This is Vancouver and Seattle and Portland and Tacoma right here. And this is the Cascade Mountains. Runs right along the coast. The wind comes from the Pacific Ocean. It's warm. It's wet. This area is very lush, very green. This is a temperate rainforest right here on the Olympic Peninsula gets on average between two to 300 inches of rain a year. That's why they always joke about Seattle being so wet and rindy. But by the time it hits the mountains, all that moisture is taken off. And when you get across the mountains, this area is desert over here. So Spokane, Washington here is in a desert, while well, Seattle is a tropical forest. So I'm gonna pause right here. There are four ways to lift air. I want you to think about what that is, and I'll be back in just a moment. All right, so I'm back. I had to deal with a little issue with my boy. Four ways to lift air. So I gave you that kind of time to think. Of course, I paused the video 
for recording, so if you, time has not passed. But there are four ways to lift air, and we've talked about the first one, which is called, we've actually talked about all these, convective. So something causes an air parcel to rise. So usually just heat, right? The air gets warm enough that it rises of its own. We just finished talking about orthographic uplift, so air over mountains or hills. Another one is frontal uplift, when two different masses of air, one is a warm mass, one is a cold mass, when they come across each other, you have one goes over the other. It's usually warm air goes over the top of cold air. This is the event that usually causes thunderstorms and tornadoes, by the way. And then the last one, convergent uplift. We don't see that here. That happens at the equator, and that's where two air masses of similar uh, temperature and humidity meet. They basically meet towards each other, and when they do, they kind of go like that. So they meet, and they kind of push up. Let's look at this. Convective uplift. So we see this in the summer all the time, right? It's a warm, sunny day. The sun beats down. It warms the air over the ground. The warm air rises. And as it rises, it becomes unstable. We see thunderstorms. Orthographic uplift, or we just talk mountains. The air is lifted by mountains. The lifting, again, causes that process of, you know, expansion and then contraction. And a frontal Uplift, you have a mass of cold air combined with a mass of warm air, and the warm air rides on top of it. It gets lifted up by that. And then the last one is this ITCZ, which we're going to talk about next, convergent uplift. This, by the way, happens around the equator, and it is the largest area of uplift in the world. Intertropical convergence zone. What it means, there's this line, this band that circles the Earth, in the summer, it's in the northern half, and in the summer, it's in the southern half. And it just basically follows the sun, north and south. And at that point, the air is so warm that it's humid that it basically is evaporating and rising straight up into the atmosphere. And the air behind it follows. So we get this large, huge conveyance of thunderstorms. And it looks like this band. So in the summer, it's right about here, roughly. And in the winter, it's right about here. And it migrates back and forth. And if you look at it from space, what you see is this line of thunderstorms. Right? So the air right here is being warmed by the sun. It rises up as it leaves the surface of the earth. Right? As it rises into the atmosphere, it pulls its moisture with it. But because this is the tropics and there's so much water and moisture, the air is very, very humid. As it rises and cools, it turns back into rain. And so this is basically a band of thunderstorms. It is why you have tropical rainstorms, because in some parts here it rains every day. So if you look at this, the tropical rainstorms of the or tropical forest of Earth here in Brazil, because this band is always going back and forth here, here in East Africa, here in Southeast Asia, and in Indonesia. So this defines tropical rainforest, steady supply of rain. All right. Now I'm going to pause right here because we're going to go into cloud types. Obviously, we're talking about rain. Rain usually comes from clouds. So, again, take the time to relax, get up, and shake it up.